welcome everyone to Health and Genomics, What's the Score with Polygenic Scores, uh, which is part of a strand of debates taking place in this room throughout the day on the theme of science and society. My name is Sandy Starr, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Progress Educational Trust, which is a charity that seeks to improve choices for people affected by infertility and genetic conditions. Now, the topic of this debate is polygenic scores, and I know for a fact that some of you in the audience know what polygenic scores are and are already immersed in various discussions about them, <clears throat> whereas others among you will have no idea or, or only the vaguest idea of what polygenic scores are. And I'd just like to say that whichever of these camps you fall into, you are very welcome to this debate. Uh, we have a brilliant panel of speakers who will cover the rudiments of what we're discussing, as well as addressing why it might be contentious. All I'll say by way of introduction uh, is that polygenic scores, often called polygenic risk scores, but there are some contexts where the term risk might not be appropriate, uh, are a statistical approach to understanding our DNA, uh, which, are, which is very different uh, from a more traditional form of genetic test. The UK government is taking polygenic scores very seriously. Uh, in a green paper on disease prevention published earlier this year, uh, the government announced that it would be trying to recruit up to 5 million healthy participants for genomic research. That's equivalent to 10% of the UK's adult population. Uh, and that a key part of this work would be to provide, and I quote, as many participants as possible with polygenic scores. So why the excitement? Why are some people very excited? Why are some people skeptical? What's the score with polygenic scores? We are fortunate uh, to have here three speakers who are eminently qualified to tell us. And they're going to speak for five to seven minutes each in the first instance. Uh, I'll introduce them briefly uh, in the order in which they're going to speak. But for more details of their various accomplishments, please see the Battle of Ideas website. First, uh, we'll hear from Professor Sir Peter Donnelly. Peter is Professor of Statistical Science at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's led a number of major national and international genetics and genomics projects over the past couple of decades. And he's the founder and chief executive of the company Genomics PLC, which among other things, uh, works with polygenic scores and is currently developing polygenic scores for, I believe, 16 serious common diseases and counting. Uh, Peter will be followed by Dr. Toby Andrew. Uh, Toby is Senior Lecturer in Human Genetics at Imperial College London, where he's also Principal Investigator in Genetics and Program Organiser for the MSc in Human Molecular Genetics. Toby has a strong interest in polygenic scores and why it is they've become the focus of so much attention lately. Last but not least, we have Nikki Drury, uh, Nikki is Principal Genetic Counselor at the Nottingham Regional Clinical Genetics Service, uh, and she also served on the UK government's Human Genetics Commission, which for several years <coughs> grappled with the thorny questions uh, thrown up for society in the wake uh, of big pioneering genetic and genomic projects of the sort that Peter has been involved with. So without further ado, uh, Peter, please tell us, what's the score with polygenic scores? Sandy, thank you very much, and thanks, everyone, for your interest. Sandy asked me to start off by uh, kind of setting the scene and giving some background uh, on exactly what polygenic scores are and what they're trying to measure. So let me start doing that, and then I'll make some comments about uh, what I see as their potential. So to set the scene, it's helpful to understand that there's a spectrum of the way in which genetics plays into human diseases. One end of that spectrum are diseases which are effectively caused by genetic changes. So situations in which if, if an individual has the wrong genetic letter in a particular gene, in some cases one copy of it, in some cases two, they'll almost certainly get sick. So those conditions are thankfully individually rare, but not collectively rare, uh, and they're rather serious. Uh, examples that you might be aware of are diseases like cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease and so on. So in those cases, to find out exactly what's causing uh, the change, the, the uh, disease in the individual, we typically have to read all of their DNA, their entire genome, 
We do that by a process called whole genome sequencing because we're kind of looking for a single needle in that big haystack, the single letter that's not what it should be that's causing the condition. Now, that's an area where UK and the National Health Service is world leading. There's a very large project uh, run by Genomics England to do that whole genome sequencing in clinical medicine, principally for kids with rare conditions, uh, putatively driven by genetic changes, and for some forms of cancer. That's kind of one end of, of the spectrum where genetics is all or most of the story for disease. At the other end of the spectrum are all of the common human diseases, heart disease, <coughs> breast cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and so on, where we know from years of study that genetics is one part of the story, uh, that has to do with how likely people are to develop the disease, but there are typically many other factors. And that's where this idea of polygenic risk scores come in. So if you take any of the common human diseases, and I'll use heart disease as an example, we know from 15 or 20 years of, of genetic studies that there are thousands or tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands, of places in our DNA, in our genome, where the letter you have there affects your risk of getting heart disease. But any one of those changes has a small effect. So it may be that on this place on a particular chromosome, if you have an A in your DNA code rather than a T, you're 2% more likely to get heart disease. That's not a worry by itself. And over here, if you have a G rather than a C, you might be 3% more likely. So individually, these uh, changes don't have big effects. They're real, uh, but, but they're not worrying individually. So the idea of polygenic risk scores is to aggregate the effect across those thousands or tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands or millions of variants in the genome. So this one bumps you up a little bit, this one bumps you down. For an individual, we'll combine all of that. So if we did that for heart disease, for everyone in the, ru in the room, uh, we'd get a distribution of scores. So that, that aggregate is the polygenic risk score for heart disease for an individual. It's kind of an overall summary of, your genetic, of the genetic part of your predisposition to the disease. So if we did it for lots of people, there'd be a distribution. Most people would end up in the middle because they have some variants which bump their risk up a bit and some which bump it down. But there'll be some individuals who end up at one end uh, with higher values of the score because they've got rather more of the variants that increase their risk. And there'll be some that end up at the other end because they've got rather more of the variants that decrease their risk. One of the reasons this area is so topical at the moment is it's only in about the last year or two we've really been able to measure in large independent studies what the consequence of being at one end or the other of that distribution is. And I'll give you two examples to, to, to uh, set the scene. So one of them uh, is breast cancer. Breast cancer is actually interesting as a disease because part of the story is at one end of the spectrum. There are rare mutations that have a big effect on breast cancer risk. There are two genes called BRCA1 and BRCA2. And if a woman has the wrong kind of mutation in one of those genes, it massively increases her risk of breast cancer. Her lifetime risk is something like 70 or 80 percent. And it potentially has a big impact on her relatives, particularly her female relatives. But breast cancer also has the property that there are thousands of other variants across the genome which have individually small effects. So if we look at those and we combine those, ignoring the BRCA genes, we can get a polygenic risk score for breast cancer. So it turns out that if a woman is in the top, say, 3% of this distribution of scores for, for breast cancer, her lifetime risk of breast cancer is about 30%. For one of those women in their early 40s, their risk of breast cancer will be about the same as a typical woman in their early to mid 50s. And the women at the other end, who happen to get the helpful variants, um, they only get to that level of breast cancer risk well into their 60s. So it gives us a way, if we had the information available, of stratifying women and detecting those who, because of their genetics, are at higher risk. In the UK, we currently offer screening for breast cancer via mammograms to every woman at age 50. I think in the light of this genetic information, that doesn't make as much sense. We, should, we have the potential to, to identify the women who are at higher risk because of their polygenic risk score. And if their risk at 40 is the same as a typical woman at 50, maybe we should start screening them at 40. And we should screen them perhaps more frequently. And the women who are at lower risk, maybe we, we don't have to screen as much or less frequency, frequently. And indeed, there was, a, there was an influential report released a couple of weeks ago by the government and the National Health Service into the NHS screening programs. And uh, amongst many very helpful, very practical suggestions, it pointed out that this approach held huge promise. That's one example. I'll give you one more example, which is heart disease. Um, heart disease involves different variants across the genome. So you're combining different things to get a polygenic risk score for, for heart disease. Heart disease is at high, much higher rates in men than women. So I'll focus on men in the numerical examples I'm giving. 
But if you take the top 3% of men for this polygenic risk score for heart disease, their lifetime risk of heart disease is something like 40%. One of those men in his early 40s has the same risk as a typical man well into his 50s. So again, if we had that information available, we could do a couple of things. Uh, our doctors could have the information and say to the men involved, you should think seriously about changing your lifestyle, about losing weight, about doing the things you can do, because they're independent of the genetics, to reduce your, life, your, your heart disease risk. The other thing we can potentially do is think about prescribing statins. There are a whole set of issues there, but that's a way of lowering cholesterol and reducing risk. Heart disease is interesting for another reason, because we currently already do things to predict a man's risk of, uh, a person's risk of, of heart disease. We, GPs have some software called QRISC, which combines an individual's age, sex, smoking history, family history, cholesterol level, blood pressure, BMI, and a few other factors. And the GP uses that to, to calculate the risk for that individual that they'll develop heart disease in the next 10 years. The current guidelines in the UK say that if uh, that risk is over 10%, then the doctor should talk to the individual both about lifestyle changes and potentially about statins as a way of reducing risk. So the right way to think about a polygenic risk score in that context is it's just one more thing that we can factor into that risk score. We use cholesterol levels currently because they're associated with risk. We could just put the polygenic risk scores into the risk score calculation. They're actually, it turns out, they're measuring something effectively independent of what the current scores are measuring. So if we had that information available, and if we could do it in the UK, there are maybe 10 million people between age 40 and 55. If we analyze them using the current approach, there'd be about a million of those 10 million people who meet the threshold so that the doctor has the discussion about statins. If we could include the polygenic risk score for genetics, two things happen. There are more individuals above that risk threshold because we're better able to stratify risk, and they're different individuals. So there are about half a million people who currently, in this hypothetical 10 million, who currently meet the risk thresholds for, um, for statins and lifestyle interventions who are invisible to the system. So it's another example where polygenic risk scores, I think, can potentially make a big difference. So I'll stop there having set the scene. I'm happy to make some more comments uh, as the discussion goes on. Thank you, uh, uh, Peter. Um, Toby, that sounds reasonable enough. Are you convinced? Thank you, Sandy. Um, OK, so uh, what I want to do in my opening comments is really just focus on um, polygenic risk scores in relation to clinical utility. And the reason I want to focus on that is I think um, there's a number of different issues that underpin uh, um, clinical utility and also quite a lot of confusion um, um, because lots of different disciplines involved uh, where people tend to talk past one another. I I'm essentially, I mean, just to... to uh, because I've only got five minutes as, as a, a spoiler. Um, essentially, I think polygenic risk scores are great for um, basic research, but I think they're much more problematic when it comes to um, clinical application. And some of the claims, um, I think, are um, implausible. So I just want to scrutinise some of that. And the reason I say, and I also have, if I have time, uh, I'm just going to briefly explain my motivations for making these criticisms, because... I often get quite an odd response when people look at me and say, well, you're a geneticist, uh, and uh, particularly, actually, more vociferously from my colleagues who uh, can't believe, uh, I mean, their first comment is, why bite the hand that feeds you? Well, because, actually, we, we want to understand what's going on. Um, so in terms of just the, 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 the caveat, in terms of, um, I mean, depending on what uh, research question you're interested in, polygenic scores aren't new. Um, they've been around for a good 10 years, as Peter said. Um, they're, they're very useful uh, for, for, for all sorts of things. Uh, there's been some great studies on missing heritability and height, uh, parental effects, um, studies of um, um, autism, and you can, you can uh, do lots of useful things. Um, the promises uh, are also not new, and they've been around for a long time, um, going way back to the 90s. Uh, and some of the problems of prediction have been discussed by epidemiologists before that in the 60s. Uh, so again, trying to, to, to predict and distinguish between uh, prediction at the individual level and, and population stratification, as uh, Peter was talking about, uh, is very important to, to, to clarify what we mean by that. Now, in terms of some of the promises um, in, specifically about genomic, um, genome-wide um, uh, polygenic scores or genome, genome uh, polygenic risk scores. 
Um, for example, uh, back in 2003, the head of the NIH at the time, Francis Collins, said in the next 10 years, so 2013 has gone by, in the next 10 years, I expect that predictive genetic tests will te exist for many common conditions so that each of us can learn our individual risks for future illness and practice more effective health maintenance and disease prevention. And similarly, uh, in 2009, on the back of uh, um, the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee report, Genomic Medicine, in July 2009, one of the things that recommend things that came out of that, that um, um, report, with a lot of expert uh, um, um, contributions, including Peter, uh, I believe, uh, it was said there, it will be several years before prediction of common disease will lead to the realistic possibility of disease prevention. But the use of many types of genomic tests is increasing rapidly, and the availability of these tests will in time have a dramatic impact on disease diagnosis and management. So there, in the past, promises have been made about the utility of these polygenic scores that are reliable enough to be able to predict at the individual level there's been a shift from, from emphasis, um, I mean, uh, I mean for, peop for, for some people in the audience, they might uh, dismiss Francis Collins' comments because he hasn't say, always said sensible things and he's not a statistician. But certainly people who are in policy and very, very important influential people talked about individual clinical prediction. There's been a shift now because uh, that, that, that's less likely to be believed to be delivered to population stratification and probability. So a shift from uh, risk uh, prediction to more probabilistic risk scores. And, and as Peter has pointed out, trying to identify people in the, in, in the very, very top uh, strata of the general population. Um, and of course, uh, in 2012, uh, the, de the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, um, announced the 100,000 whole genome sequencing project and described that the, 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 the premise or the, the, the rationale for that um, initiative was a genomics revolution in the NHS. So there's a lot to deliver, folks, okay? Um, so in terms of um, applying usefully uh, um, these polygenic scores to, to clinical application, what are the problems? First of all, I've mentioned uh, um, the distinction between individual prediction and population stratification. Uh, in the 2009 report, the expert um, 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 witnesses pointed out that if you want to be able to uh, have anything of clinical utility at an individual level, you'd need a relative risk uh, for individual risk factors of at least uh, 30 to 40. And if you're going to have a polygenic risk score, you'd need to, to match that, right? Uh, you know, because all of the um, risk loci that have been identified for common disease, such as coronary heart disease and breast cancer, excluding BRCA1 and 2, have relative risks or odds ratios of 1.1, 1.2. Very, very small. Um, so we're, we're talking about stratification. There's, uh, things have changed. And what has changed? Well, the biobank has come on stream, half a million people from, from, from the UK. There's been some very influential papers off the back of that, including Seth Catherine paper in Nature Genetics, um, September last year, uh, where they had a very misleading title saying, our polygenic risk score can predict common disease uh, um, as accurately as we can predict monogenic disease. And a lot of people objected to that, but Nature Genetics didn't uh, publish uh, responding papers or any um, uh, letters of, of trying to just point out why that was misleading and actually factually incorrect. There was also uh, an influential paper by Mike Anui uh, in the American Journal of, of, um, <clears throat> of Cardiology, um, and at least that paper improved on Catherine's paper in that they tried to separate out statistically the contribution of the polygenic risk score to disease. Whereas the Catherson um, paper, they just said, oh, we've managed to achieve uh, um, a, 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 a kind of predictive power that's quite good. Uh, it has a relative risk of three in the top tail compared to the rest of the population and it gets stronger as you go more and more into the tail of the, 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 the distribution. But they didn't actually spell out, they didn't um, say what the predictive power that the polygenic risk score brings to the table. And all of that prediction was accounted for by age, sex, and family history and, and smoking, right? You need to actually explain and, and, and quantify what these polygenic risk scores to the table and the answer is not very much statistically they can be detected 
but in terms of the actual effect size, they're tiny. So Mike uh, Anui's paper, he at least quantifies that distinction, and <clears throat> it adds about two or three percent to the predictive power. You, the metric that they use is, is uh, 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 it ranges between 0.5 and 1. But you need, again, if the area under the curve, a particular metric, that is a function of sensitivity and specificity about making a decision. Do you have the disease or don't you have the disease? You, 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 not just the population. If you're going to make that kind of clinical decision, you need really, really accurate data. And ideally, you need to be, to be able to predict the individual level. OK. Um, I'll just say, uh, in terms of uh, um, theor theoretical problems, is that even if you predict um, heritability, and, and in theory you can. I mean, there have been papers on height by, by Peter Fisher where he's accounted for all of the missing heritability. But even if you do that, there's a cap because heritability doesn't account for the entire trait, whether it's a disease or quantitative trait. So you've still got a lot of noise, and we'll hear about that in the later session this afternoon. Robert Plowman has a lot to say about that. So this, and the, the final point is, clinically speaking, so what? Even if these, these um, um, uh, prediction, score, prediction scores uh, can actually predict with accuracy what, what treatment is there? What are we going to do with that information? And if actually for coronary artery disease we have these very expensive, sophisticated polygenic risk scores and all we can say to them at the end is eat less, exercise more, we should all be doing that uh, so we can save a lot of money. Same with statins. People are already advocating polypills. Okay. Two, <coughs> two contrasting views. Uh, Nikki, what are genetic counsellors to make of all this? <laughs> so um, I've got to be honest that when Sandy asked me on Thursday if I'd be on this very eminent panel, I did think, um, what can I bring to this? But I have worked for nearly 20 years as a genetic counsellor, and uh, so I, I, I think I can maybe bring something to this debate. In the clinical genetics um, field, we do dr deal with... Um, uh, individuals and people with a strong family history where we're looking for uh, single gene, uh, single variants uh, that are clearly pathogenic, which have a very high um, effect. And we don't use polygenic risk scores. There is some research going on, um, as Peter has outlined, particularly looking at breast cancer risk stratification in women without highly penetrant single gene disorders like BRCA1, BRCA2, or even PALV2, which has been begun to be tested for more recently. So what's the potential for polygenic risk scoring? Um, uh, I think that uh, I'm interested in more research going on into what contribution it can make potentially, and I think it's unclear whether it can yet, but into trying to identify that very small number of individuals that wouldn't currently be picked up by family history or other risk um, assessment tools that might benefit from additional screening or therapeutic preventative med medications. Um, so, you know, the jury's out on that, I think, at the moment. And I think it could potentially, I know it's begun to be looked at, how can it contribute towards drug development? Something, again, that's very problematic. Drugs, Therapeutic drugs take a long time to come to market. We've got a lot to learn, and we could improve things there. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they can, they can make a contribution there. Um, so far, so good. So what are some of my reservations, then? I suppose one of my biggest concerns and reservations, because uh, these... Scores are being used in private genetic testing. So whilst they're not available and being used except on a research basis on the NHS, they are in terms of private testing. And I think misinterpretation is a really big um, issue. I mean, the common discourse around genetics is a very black and white understanding. You know, people either have or don't have a high um, genetic risk. And the kind of information generated isn't really like that. And I think we saw a recent case with um, Matt Hancock, the Secretary, Secretary of State for Health, who had a, one of these uh, tests and got a result saying that he was at a 15% risk uh, 
of developing prostate cancer. And we got into a bit of a panic and said, oh, I'll have to go and talk to my GP about additional screening. And the population risk is actually 18%. Most of those 18% um, of men dying from other things, not on, um, with uh, prostate cancer, not off <coughs> prostate cancer. So I suppose my point there is they could create an awful lot of unnecessary anxiety as well as waste NHS resources. Also concerned with um, if these tests are offered uh, uh, privately, for example, or, or as part of the NHS, but more with this point privately, about false negatives. So understandably, somebody with, say, for example, a family history of breast cancer might think, oh, I can't be bothered to wait weeks to go and see the GP and then wait to see, you know, to get referred on. I'm concerned about my family history. I'll get some testing um, privately, sort this out for myself, and all power to them for trying to do that. But, um, you know, we know that we're used to, when we're signing up for... Uh, you know, all sorts of things on the internet. You have lots of terms and conditions and small print. You're used to racing through it and just marching on. And it, the, even though they do try to explain in these tests that they're not testing for highly penetrant single genes, people don't always understand that because they've raced through all the terms and conditions, etc. So a person that might be a very high risk or might actually carry a highly penetrant single gene mutation and might benefit from extra screening, <coughs> maybe some um, chemo prevention or other options would have false reassurance. And I, I think that's a big worry. In terms of predictive value, we really don't know what predictive value um, these scores will have because uh, we don't know what, what, what kind of... Um, risk these variants will have in a population without a family history, which could be quite different. There's a problem of equity. Um, the databases are not, are, have a bias towards a white Caucasian European population, and um, therefore people of different ethnicities currently wouldn't be offered accurate risk information on pelagenic scores. And also I agree with Toby's point about a lack of acceptable interventions. These short scores, even if they are found to be robust in due course, and who knows, if there are no acceptable interventions, what is the point in telling someone they're at a higher risk of developing a condition unless there are acceptable interventions other than lifestyle change? Because re research has shown that knowing you're at high genetic risk um, doesn't have sustained impact on lifestyle change. Uh, I mean, lastly, and I think this is going to be discussed later today, um, there's the expansion of polygenic risk scores in the social arena, which is a whole different um, issue. So I'm sounding quite negative, but I suppose I'm cautiously optimistic with more research that polygenic risk scores might be able to provide something useful if they're in re research. If I was going to give them a score, I'd probably give them a four to five out of ten. The jury's <laughs> out. Can we thank our speakers? <laughs> um, just before I go out to the audience, I'll give you a brief right of reply, Peter. And to grasp the nettle, um, Matt Hancock's polygenic score for prostate cancer came from your company. Um, so what happened there? Um, so I'll deal with that first and then a couple of general comments, uh, but it's related to the general issues. As both the other speakers have said, it's really important to understand how to interpret and how not to interpret polygenic risk scores. The way uh, I think about it is that polygenic risk scores are like other medical tests. They give you information that says something about your risk. If the doctor measures your cholesterol and you have a high cholesterol level, then you're at increased risk of heart disease. It doesn't mean you'll definitely get heart disease, but you're at increased risk. If your blood pressure is high, you're at increased risk. If you've got a high polygenic risk score, you're at increased risk. So they're not trying, uh, no one in the field is trying to say they predict whether you'll get the disease or not. And I tried to, in my distinction at the beginning about genetics being one part of the story uh, for the common diseases, I was trying to be clear on that. Um, so interpretation is important and they're a risk factor. They're one of the things we could take into account. In the case of Matt Hancock, actually, actually he totally got that, and when he talked about it, he explained it well, and what he said was, uh, 
that he had found through having his polygenic risk score measured that he's at about 50% increased risk of prostate cancer compared to the average. He said, as a consequence, I wasn't aware that that was something, we have no family history, um, I wasn't aware that was something that I should focus on, but clearly I should. When it was reported, it was misreported, and you know, the health secretary said he's going to get prostate cancer because of this test, and so on. So I interpretation is critical. They're risk factors. We should think about them like other risk factors. Cholesterol, uh, the things Toby was uh, talking about, measuring cholesterol doesn't pass any of those things. It doesn't give you an odds ratio of 30. It doesn't determine who will or who won't get heart disease. Why do doctors measure cholesterol levels now, and why are we happy as patients for that to happen? Because we can make a better prediction of my risk with my cholesterol level than without it. Polygenic risk scores are like that. We can make better predictions of risk with polygenic risk scores than without. Thank you, Peter. Just before, and uh, just to say, as I open up the discussion, people are welcome to ask questions or make comments on matters of opinion, but you're equally welcome to ask our speakers for uh, clarification on anything they've said or terminology or, or so on. This is a te somewhat technical subject, albeit it's of uh, increasing public interest, and as such, there's no such thing uh, as a stupid question. If there's something you're not clear about, uh, just ask. So I'll take all, uh, contributions in batches before returning to the panel to respond. I'd like to remind you to wait and speak clearly into the microphone. If you'd like to give your name and say why you're interested in this topic, you're more than welcome to, but you're not obliged to if you'd prefer not to. Now, who would like to contribute? I'm speaking as that, actually. Um, so um, I would kind of want to defend uh, the, the uh, importance of, of, of this uh, breakthrough, really. So to give you a, a kind of a similar example, in Japan there's four kinds of loop. Um, there has now been a, a photograph taken of every single loop in Japan, and uh, machine learning AI just uh, used those uh, to uh, identify the risks for each of those roofs of uh, hurricane damage. Now, that's really useful and, and rich data. That data has not been used in any way in an individual basis to rate those properties to set premiums. What it has been used for is to make sure that we have the right resources available in the event of a hurricane, because you know, the different routes are affected differently by different hurricanes. So it's just to make sure the luster adjusters are in the right place at the right time. It does seem to me that this is really rich data that could be used for making sure the right resources are available, you know, and, and, and forgetting really about using it on an individual basis, but using it on a much more population level. Okay. Yes, my name's Richard Gilding, I'm GP, and I've also worked in medical underwriting. Um, and there's been concern about uh, <coughs> risk scores, um, making people uh, essentially un uh, uninsurable from a, a life assurance point of view. I'd like to hear the, uh, the panel's views on that, of whether, whether this could be detrimental to people and, and prevent them from getting life assurance. Okay. Hi, thanks for the lucid explanations. I just have a couple of questions, maybe slightly technically. Um, if I understood Peter's explanation of how the risk scores are calculated, it sounded like uh, you add up the risks across all the variants. How do you know that it's not a multiplicative effect? And also, once you've calculated scores, how do you, know, how do you validate them uh, when you have different samples? Hi, can the, um, the, the, the scoring system not just highlight the risk of developing a disease, but also point clinicians in the right direction for the therapy that might be most effective and therefore feed into the concept of more personalized medicine in the future? Thank you. Um, so I'll come back to the panel to respond. And just to um, reiterate what we have on the table, um, we've heard from an actuary defending uh, the importance of uh, machine learning in a different context in relation to hurricanes in Japan, talking about the sort of rich data that we shouldn't necessarily uh, uh, forego. Question from uh, a GP about whether risk scores could make people uninsurable. And um, I know there's, there's a sort of concordat and moratorium on the use of predictive genetic uh, tests in, in setting insurance premiums, but I don't know how that applies to polygenic scores, if at all, so that would be interesting to know. Um, we have a couple of questions about um, whether the, uh, uh, correct me if I'm using the wrong terminology, about whether it's multiplicative or, addi or additive, um, the way the data works in the polygenic scores and how, and how the scores are validated. Um, and we've had a question about the potential uh, for more personalised treatment, not just assessing risk, but guiding how, how therapy might work. Um, nobody can answer all of that, but who would like to pick up one of those threads? Um, go ahead, Peter. Um, well, let me, do the, let me do the technical one first. Um, 
uh, I was trying to be informal, they do, the risks are combined multiplicatively, formally rather than additively, and you asked how we validate them, it actually comes to a question that, that has been uh, raised. I, I take issue with the claim that the science isn't there, so what, what do we do to check how useful these scores are? We learn which variants to measure in one genetic study or a large series of genetic studies. We lock those down, so we decide the algorithm for calculating the score. We then take that score into a completely separate set of individuals, UK Biobank, that's 500,000 people. And you can just look using the health information of UK Biobank in hundreds of thousands of people, totally independent from the ones we use to derive the score. What happens if you're in the top 3% of risk for coronary disease or for breast cancer? And that's the data I was talking about. So actually, I think the scientific data is really solid. Um, uh, on the, should I do the life insurance point? Yes. Briefly, okay. um, as you say, Sandy, there is a moratorium currently on the use of genetic information. Uh, I, I think it's, a, it's an issue, an important issue for us as society, how we think about this and how it plays into um, insurance issues. Actually, because polygenic risk scores are risk factors rather than determinative, um, knowing you have a BRCA mutation or a Huntington's mutation or a cystic fibrosis, uh, two copies of cystic fibrosis mutation, has a much, much bigger impact on your life insurance uh, prospects than polygenic risk scores do. Anything you wanted to come back on, Nikki? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, I suppose in terms of the benefits, potential benefits um, for individual patients, if mm -hmm. we can stratify risk for those without highly penetrant single gene disorders, you know, it is there are um, a small percentage of women that aren't captured um, by uh, having, you know, they don't have highly penetrant single gene disorders, but could be benefit significantly. And, um, I know in Manchester at the moment, they're using, uh, I think, an 18 SNPs um, to, uh, on women, when they come in for screening uh, in the first instance, to stratify risk. So small minority then that would have um, be offered additional breast screening. But they're a minority that would um, uh, that have a much higher percentage uh, potentially of the breast cancers and um, the, if you could pick breast cancers up at a much earlier stage then obviously that's hugely beneficial and a, a, a really high proportion of women who <coughs> currently have annual breast screen uh, sorry three yearly breast screening from approximately 50 um, to 70 who actually don't need that um, three yearly breast screening who uh, you know it causes unnecessary intervention and harm and if you could get an effective risk stratification tool using um, things like you know a, a, a variance of small significance but that add up to a collective effect then it could be that those women don't have to have that um, screening till later okay. till they are at higher risk okay Toby go for it so um, I think on this point about, um, you know, reliability and is the science there, it's important. Um, I mean, I think back in the 2009 House of Lords report, they, they just explained this uh, in lay terms very well. It's very important to distinguish between what they described as assays um, and tests. And I would agree with Peter that in terms of the, um, the science is, is solid in that these are replicated in research terms. These are absolutely nailed down, replicated and replicated and replicated <coughs> variants that contribute to quantitative <coughs> traits and, and common disease. And we know those associations are true, um, but they're very, very tiny effects. And when it comes to um, any kind of prediction, Q risk, uh, cholesterol, conventional measures, age, sex, all of those things are used, and of course they're used, but size does matter. And so we have to get a bit technical here. So. There's one publication that actually claimed that polygenic risk scores were contributing to coronary artery disease, and actually the lion's share was explained by conventional measures, age, sex, and, and family history, and so on. Uh, I don't know if they include family history, but um, so it was only the second paper that actually tried to separate that out. Now, they used a metric called uh, area under the curve, which is just a function of sensitivity and specificity, making a decision about whether you've got the disease or not. And they, uh, in com combination, it's fair enough, I, 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 I don't disagree, I'm not a genetic exceptionalist. You can use these scores exactly the same as any other convention conventional measure and make the point that they're risk scores, they're probabilistic, they've got no utility or very little utility, 
uh, at the individual in, in any kind of deterministic way. But the, 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 the combined effect was 0.69. So that, that you know, it, 0.5 means it's the same as tossing the coin and it's 50-50. It's got no predictive value whatsoever. If the AUC is one, it's, it's perfectly predictive, like Huntington's Korea. If you've got that mutation, you will get the disease. A point, 0.69, that was combined. On its own, it was 0.62. That's, that, I mean, that's so far away from prediction. Any kind of um, population screens, for, if you're going to do it for a population screen to the general population, you need an AUC of at least 0.99. And anything, and if, if, if you've got people who are coming to you because uh, they've, they've got family history or they've got some, uh, some reason they think they're ill, that they've got a lump on their breast or whatever, then it might help with treatment. Of course, add that, you know, it's extra information. You're not going to squander it. But 2%, you know, okay. that, 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 it's, it, it's, it's not bringing anything to the table at the moment. So the science quickly, isn't there. Quickly, Peter. Um, so I completely agree with Toby that these things are indivi the individual genetic variants have small effects. So what we're talking about is what happens when you aggregate by multiplying those uh, collectively. Specifically on heart disease, there are various things we currently use to predict heart disease risk. The biggest single predictor of heart disease risk is someone's age. The second biggest predictor is whether they're male or female. The third biggest individual predictor is their polygenic risk score. It's comparable with the individual effect of using blood pressure in prediction. It's stronger, so it's more useful than the individual effect of using cholesterol. It's more useful than the individual effect of using, smoke, of using family history. So uh, no one's saying it's the answer by itself, but to somehow say, oh, it's very small and it doesn't matter very much and it doesn't add much to the area under the curve, it's more useful than a whole bunch of things we currently use. If we could use it, why on earth wouldn't we? Okay, audience, can we start over that side, please? Uh, what's driving this? What's driving the, the hype and the excitement? You know, I just don't think that was misrepresentation with Matt Hancock. I read everything he said. If anyone wants to see what mainstream scientists responded to Matt, look on our website for, for that particular reaction. But it was so enthusiastic. In fact, he did it in order to talk up these tests. And you've got Sally Davis has done uh, briefings at the Science Media Centre. Genetics is the way forward. Personalised medicine. We will all get the results of these tests and be able to treat it personally. David Cameron set up Genomics England because of his interview. There is a theme here. There was huge excitement and enthusiasm for this. So I'm just really intrigued as to what's driving it. I mean, you're presenting very measured. Of course, it's not the answer, but it's one tiny bit. But it's not being talked about as one tiny bit. It's being talked about in these very excitable terms of the future and, and personalised medicine has arrived. So is that something malign? Uh, or is that just excitement? And, and it, it, you know, as, as Hillary said, it's, it's an exciting new development, so we are excited about it. What's going on here? In real life, these scores are often going to be used as add-ons to other stuff. It's not really going to take them on their own. But you were saying on their own it beats this, on their own it beats that, you've got a higher level of things. But clearly, in many contexts, we've got a lot of information. So the real life scenario is going to be what does this add? So can I just bring it back to that conversation? Because really, that's what that's the point I think in, can be, in practical use, that's how it's going to work. The <coughs> slightly um, related question, partly for Peter, but for everybody, is you were talking about the top, I think. 3% for both of it, hard time graph, it was 1% for stress, I forget which way around it was. Um, so in a, in a sense, you're kind of trawling the whole population to find these 3%, or if you go into more extreme, 1% or whatever. So I think the, the, as I understand it, the kind of model, economically, practically, only kind of works with a huge net to catch 3% in that case, so for example, that's where it goes over the threshold. Now some people have taken this to a real extreme, haven't they? They said, could we get to this monogenic? I think Tony mentioned that. And that would be like screening the entire population to find people with severe monogenic disorders rather than waiting for them to come to us. Because uh, if they happen to be clinical just at the moment, we've got a family history, we'll all be ill. So what are you proposing is kind of a model where we do trawl the whole population for these top 3% or 1%. And if you are, how is that different from trawling the whole population for people with severe monogenic disorders who aren't really aware of it because they haven't been clinical family history? Hello. Um, I know you talk a lot about disease, and that's fascinating. I'm, I'm just interested in some of the research context where they put scores to predict things that aren't about disease, and mm. kind of, you know, how, how likely you are to be a happy-go-lucky positive person, or, or your ability to manage finances. So, it's just, I wonder if it's that one. I so just wondered what you thought about that beyond the, the very relevant stuff about disease. It seems uh, to me that the question about whether or not scores are going to have utility uh, for stratification is really a health economics question. Uh, and I was wondering whether you were aware of any 
uh, economic studies that have been done to show whether or not they will have uh, economic use. And in particular, uh, whether genomic PLC has any plans to commercialize the stores, and whether the insurance companies or the health service do in practice think there's demand for them. Okay. Um, I'm going to let the panel come back briefly, and then I'm going to get one last round uh, from the audience. What's driving the hype? Uh, is there more to say about the man, Matt Hancock uh, episode? Um, trawling the whole population to find the 1% or the 3%. Um, utility for stratification, and uh, whether there have been economic studies, and, and, and the use of scores for non-health context. There'll be more debate about that later today, but maybe we can just touch on it briefly. Who'd like to come back on any of that? Go on, Toby. Okay, so uh, on the hype and, and why the excitement, I, th I, th I think um, the reason is uh, related to, um, is this has been driven by the government. Um, and I think it's related to the fact that the government are very, very keen and I think genuinely believe that the way forward for the British economy is the health and wealth, wealth of the nation. And that the biomedicine uh, um, research and, uh, and industry has a major, major role to play in that. And um, there's also, a, a, you know, a, a, on broader terms, I mean, I think the significance of David Cameron uh, announcing the 100,000 genome rather than, I don't know, the, the Sally Davis, the, the, the chief medical officer, is that, uh, you know, in different ways, we're all currently witnessing a massive political exhaustion. Um, and, you know, we're all fed up with it. But you imagine if you're in the driving seat and you've got all these kind of surly faces, you know, and everyone's saying, well, show us some vision. Um, I think, you know, the reason, that, that, you know, in, in some way, that David Cameron was on, uh, on board for that was like, we all love the NHS, and it sounds great if we say genomics revolution, because uh, it, it revolution, because it sounds uh, visionary, and we're, we can all get on board, and it, it might be an electoral winner. But it, there is a tyranny in, in, in academia. I mean, universities have, have kind of been destroyed by the, the various market kind of um, um, uh, initiatives. Um, and in addition to the health and wealth of the nation, we're all having to sign up to translational research. And uh, there's lots of translational research that goes on. A lot of it is actually just basic uh, science. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, um, it, it, doesn't you know it doesn't necessarily... It, there's no guarantee it's going to have a, a, an application. Uh, so there's a very instrumental demand from politicians uh, for science to, to give credibility to that. Ironically... Um, actually, there's very little practical um, uh, translational research in terms of monogenic disease and so on. So we've recently had a, a lovely story yesterday on cystic fibrosis, where they've actually now got a new drug. Um, and that was crowdfunded by the patients, right? So, you know, there isn't, there's a gap between uh, real translation and application on things we know about. Okay. Uh, Peter, would you like to pick up? Agree? Disagree? Um, yeah. A couple of things. Um, I mean, just briefly, many people will be aware of this. David Cameron's first son had a rare and very extreme genetic disorder. So I think it's slight, whatever one thinks of various other things he has done and did as prime minister, I think to say that he was just driving the genetics thing because he thought it would be a vote winner is a bit harsh on him. I think he was genuinely positive about the potential impact. Um, on the top 3% and, uh, you know, are we just trawling generally? Uh, what's interesting is uh, you're probably not in the top 3% for heart disease, and you're probably not in the top 3% for prostate cancer. So the chance that you're in either of those groups is, in fact, 3%, and they're effectively independent. But for each of us across 20 diseases, we will be in the top few percent for something. So actually, another way of thinking about this uh, is for each of us, there'll be one or two diseases that we happen to be at increased risk just because of the hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of genetic variants we've inherited. So one way of thinking about it, instead of thinking disease by disease, where it's only a small group of individuals, um, we can think about it as individuals of learning and for our doctors learning what are the one or two things that we're at more increased risk of because of our genetics. Um, what's the right way forward, uh, and is it the same as trawling and rare diseases? So one thing that we haven't covered is, as I said at the beginning, to learn about uh, whether you have a mutation that's causing this rare condition, you effectively have to read the entire genome. That currently costs... 500 to 1,000 pounds. To get the information for polygenic risk scores, costs, you use a different technology. It measures a subset of the genome, and it costs of the order of 30 pounds per person at scale. So it's much, much, you know, it's cheaper than many other medical tests, and you can use it uh, fairly broadly. Have there been health economic studies? Not yet, but they're happening. Uh, what are genomics plans? Um, I mean, I believe strongly, and we believe strongly, that the potential impact of polygenic risk scores in healthcare is substantial. 
Um, I think and we think strongly that we have to wait, make sure we get it right. There are key issues about interpretation, about making sure people understand it, about answering the question disease by disease, what do you do if you have a high polygenic risk score? You have to know how should we do something differently. In some cases, it'll be about screening. In other cases, it'll be about putting it into workflows. So those are important things and we're on the case. Okay, Nikki, do you want to say anything briefly? Well, what I was going to say is why, why are they doing this? Well, there's a massive amount of data out there that I think is incredibly tempting, especially when there's a lot of money to be made as well mm -hmm. um, uh, through uh, offering private patients private genetic testing. So that's one driver. And I think, you know, that if we can... If it, if, it, if it is proven to be of some use, if we can recategorize a chunk of people as at lower risk, that's significant and could have be health benefits for those in a lower risk, risk group in terms of not having unnecessary intervention. For example, you know, um, women diagnosed with a kind of breast cancer that actually would, would have um, not progressed to invasive breast cancer that might have gone away if it, on its own, might not have been picked up if they hadn't had unnecessary screening. Can I have some final contributions? And so a lot of these conversations seem to be very breast cancer focused. Um, so I work in interpreting and analysing genetic variants of patients um, and reporting them to clinicians. Um, at the moment we already have full screens and predictive testing for people who have got found a history of breast cancer and who are diagnosed at an early stage. Um, so I still quite haven't worked out at what point in the patient pathway um, it's envisioned for this to be applied because when we're interpreting these variants, so much of it uses phenotypic data and family history and it's so difficult to interpret variants without that information. Although you might get something that seems fully pathogenic, it still goes hand in hand with the, with the phenotype. Um, and within sort of other areas of genetics, so developmental disorders, there's a huge push for phenotype first approaches where you go in with a phenotype and then from there you sequence certain genes and and you start from that, whereas this, with a genotype-first approach, just seems a little bit worrying to me um, when it comes to interpretation. Um, also agreeing with whether the broadening the patient landscape is beneficial, um, because risk does mean different things for different people. And it was mentioned, 2% was the figure that was mentioned, is supposedly very low uh, risk to be increased, but 2% means different things to different patients for, for disease. Um, and sorry, one last thing. Um, it was mentioned about... Um, false negatives coming from, I think Nikki mentioned, false negatives coming from private um, testing, um, but also false positives um, have been seen. I've personally seen a lot of false positives, people finding them um, in the private sector, coming to the NHS with those, us not being able to identify it. So it's, it, it can also create a lot of its own its own problems. So those are just my thoughts. Two quick questions. One, um, for, uh, do, we know, do we know the positive and negative predictive value for, for example, being the top 3% risk for, for a particular disease because I think just knowing the rate of false positives and false negatives is uh, sort of clinically sort of more intuitively helpful. Um, the other thing um, is if you uh, if you find you're at particularly low risk for say a heart disease, um, could that have negative effects? Could you think, oh well I might as well just eat what I want and drink what I want? You know, why, why would you then take care of your health and would that potentially have a, a worse, uh, you know, sort of more negative effect in the longer term? The problem is that the polygenic scores are based on very simplified data sets, which means simplified in terms of the phenotype. You have a group of patients that you call them type 2D, and then you have a group of controls. You don't have any information about which variants associate with some phenotypes in order to have any uh, clinical utility. And also, as you already know, you don't have the causal variants. And because you do not have the actual causal variants, you only have statistically significant variants, you don't know any interactions between specific variants with the environment, and also uh, you cannot uh, predict with accuracy. Even if I am at a very low risk, I may have that change on that particular part of the chromosome that together with my environment did give me the disease. So really, they're, they're, they're completely meaningless. Related to that point, it seems like um, you've got single gene diseases, which, you know, they are causative. And you can kind of understand the chemistry and biochemistry of how they cause that disease. But as I understand it, these are um, associations between disease and a whole bunch of stuff. So you're not, you don't know the mechanism of how those uh, all of that genes cause, uh, end up in this disease. And it, it could uh, be through any number of mechanisms. It could be through changes in the psychology of the person or the, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. Normally in medicine, before you do an intervention and before you ratify that, you do a clinical trial. So you'd say, so you've done the science where you say, yeah, these are associated. 
But you haven't done the bit where you say, okay, I can actually improve outcomes by intervening. Uh, and you need a control group where you also intervene and talk to those people to stop eating so much. And that in that case, you can get trouble in which it's a sizable effect. Okay, final contribution. I'd just like to ask a quick maths question here. If, if you've got two, two of these, two of these um, changes in, in your chromosomes or whatever, um, A and B, if you don't know what the sort of uh, pathogenic pathway is, pathogenic pathway is, um, you, they might both be using the same pathway. So you don't know whether A and B doubles your score or, you know, it's still the same score or even one might cancel the other one out. If, you don't, don't you have to, you know, you're just, you're not possibly confusing uh, correlation with causation. Okay, you can't address everything that's just been asked, but if you'd like to pick, choose something and also offer your concluding thought very briefly, and I'll do it in the same order that you started, starting with you, Peter. To go back to an early comment, there's a difference between genetics and people who are already sick, which is the understanding mutations, interpreting them, doing them in the context of um, phenotypes, and genetics in people who are currently healthy to try and identify uh, disease, diseases for which they are at risk and to work out how to use that information clinically for prevention. Uh, and kind of classical human genetics and sequencing is in the first category, people who are already sick, and this discussion is about the second category. It's about um, understanding risk before people are sick broadly. A couple of questions, uh, I maybe talk afterwards about the, the um, independence issue, but um, whatever you think about how these scores are derived and whether you believe that we found causes of mutations or not, and, and uh, all of those criticisms have some merit, just view them as a black box. So I, or the other people who have written papers on this, have done a genetic study, they've come up with a way of combining variants in the genome. We then take that into a totally independent set of 500,000 people, and that's very big by uh, the standards of any medical study, and you can just measure in that group what the consequence of having a high score is or a low score. So that's independent validation. Whatever you think about whether we found the causal variants or not found the causal variants, it's there. Uh, actually, and in medicine, causality, we don't know causality a lot of the time. We don't know why lots of drugs work. In, in the case of many successful drugs, we don't even know what the target is, um, but we know they work. So it would be much better if we understood the causality of all of the diseases. We'd be much better at choosing drugs. We'd be much better at choosing drug targets. But we are, we are where we are. Concluding comment, uh, we have to get this right. We have to think hard about the issues of interpretation. We have to work out what the right trials are and do those trials. We have to think about the health economics. But I think the promise is very substantial. I think we owe it to patients to do that work and to find out what the potential is. Thank you. Wait till the end for a problem. Toby, you love black boxes. What do you think? Um, so the black box point is fine, um, but there's still on the table this unanswered question. How much do these polygenic risk scores bring to the table? Um, it's fine to say they're risk scores like any other conventional measures. That's fine. And it's also fine to say that uh, we're, we're interested in combi uh, combining these, genetics and tr uh, conventional measures, to try and stratify the population. Um, and Peter hasn't answered that question. These studies, um, and, and the, the data that has been published shows, despite criticism of the floor saying 2% might be quite a lot, it's not. It's not actually, you know, it, you, you, it, the, uh, an area under the curve means you need to have high sensitivity and high specificity. You need to have, you, you don't want a high rate of false positives. If you do that for the mass of the population for breast screening, for example, it will have consequences where you'll frighten a lot of uh, women, for example, and they, they'll have maybe mastectomies. If, you know, so you need to do the validation studies. So it needs to be quantified. How much does it bring to the table in terms of prediction at, at an individual level, if you're going to apply that? You need to validate it. Are we really measuring what, what, what we think we are? Because it's a black box. The final point is, is there a treatment? I mean, with Huntington's career, it's really serious. People want to, may or may not want to know, but they probably want to know because they want to plan their life and prepare for death, right? It's grim. Whereas with a polygenic risk score, if you're just, if, if there's no treatment, then, and it's just take, take more exercise and eat less, why, why bother? The other thing is that this, these scores won't work if, if it's not a polygenic trait. Cancer is highly heterogeneous. Lots of common diseases, highly heterogeneous, including diabetes. It might be underpinned by heterogeneity. So the polygenic scores won't work. We need to do the studies. And finally, it's increasingly irrational because a lot of these polygenic scores are no more than horoscopes, uh, and, and that's what people are doing with all these apps. And, 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 and scientists who know better, who should know better, actually have given up on mechanisms, as, as I said at the back. In, in the early days, people were talking about finding the functional variants, having molecular insights, identifying the molecular pathways, developing drugs, drugs for everybody. 
um, and, uh, and so on. Whereas now it's like, well, we can't find the functional variance, let's have a black box approach, partition the po population variance, it's only probabilistic, you get told off if you, if you say uh, um, um, it's, you, 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 you know, you're confusing individual, individual prediction and uh, population stratification. It's, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors that's going on and, and people need to be skeptical about the scientific merit of some of this. Nikki, your final thoughts. Um, so I think currently we can't be certain how useful polygenic risk scores are going to be. Um, uh, they're not a promise as things stand. I think we should do more research and find out how valuable or useful they are or not. Um, and I wouldn't see them as an either or. I think in terms of risk stratification, if we were going to be using them, I think we'd be using them on top of our conventional risk assessment, depending on the particular disease, um, uh, so including family history, in which case other kind of testing might be more appropriate. Um, and I, I agree that we should only really be doing this in situations where there is something other than lifestyle advice that can be offered some kind of preventative kind of treatment or additional screening, etc. Can we thank our brilliant speakers, please? Peter, Tony, and, uh, yeah.